Well, Happy New Year, and again, thank you for this opportunity to the OCSG to present again at the beginning of the year to your community. Uh, we're talking about a very interesting topic. Uh, we're going to talk about positive psychology and its application in autism. Um, there's a lot of information on my slides because, again, with the Zoom meetings, it's a very unique way of uh, presenting. So I'm not comfortable with it. I'm sure you guys understand why. Uh, but you will have uh, the slides uh, available to you. Judy's going to forward them to you in the form of PDF so that you can take a look at the information. So don't try to write things down. Just try to absorb as much of it as you can so we can have an interesting discussion afterwards. We're going to go through the slides first. If you have questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, I'm not sure, Judy, if you're going to be able to let me know if somebody has a question because I'm, once I'm going to go to my PowerPoint, I won't see people's responses. Yeah, um, Alex, what I'll do is if you do have a question, please feel free to use the chat feature and Alex will look for opportunities to interrupt you if there is a question. And then at the end, we can maybe open it up a bit more. I might not see the chat either, but just let me know that there's a question and I'll just stop so we can have a more interactive process. Sounds good. Okay. All right, let me figure out how to share the screen. Here we go. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay. Hopefully yep, everyone... can see it. Thank you. Okay. All right, so. Oh. One second. It's not actually working well. Um, yeah, Alex, we could see this the presentation when you shared it. I don't know if it was the. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, let's see if we can switch to the next slide. See, I don't know why it's skipping slides. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll start. Okay. Well, um, let's talk about po what positive psychology is all about. And uh, again, the application of it to autism is a fairly new concept. It's a fairly new field. Dr. Martin Seligman was the one who introduced the concept of positive psychology to the world of um, clinical psychology and my, my colleagues. Uh, so the application is fairly new and it'll be interesting to uh, to talk about what are some of the challenges that you guys as parents or individuals on the spectrum feel uh, that this may uh, uh, illustrate. But as we all know, if we talk about the ideas of positive psychology, the word optimism comes to mind. And the, the question of whether or not our lives are glasses half full or glasses half empty has been you know, presented many, many times in our life. And of course, the glass half full is viewed as an optimistic view of life and uh, half empty is a pessimistic concept um, that ultimately affects the way that we perceive our reality and our, our environment, our lives and people around us. Optimism in psychology has been uh, defined as focus on an expectation of good things. And it's also a particular explanatory style that tells the story of our lives uh, and that narrates the story of our lives and thus leads to certain emotions and, and uh, behaviors. Um, uh, one of the uh, older uh, philosophers, um, said that the best of all possible worlds is the world that we live in. This was the concept that challenged the, the, the um, dichotomy of glass full, glass, uh, glass half full, glass half empty. And he said that the glass is as full as it can be or as it can get at this point, which brought the idea of relative optimism. Optimism comes from the word, Latin word optimus, meaning best, where the pessimism is from the word pessimus, meaning worst. An important term that not many people refer to uh, in, this, uh, in this context is meliorism, which comes from the Latin word melior or better. We talk about ameliorating symptoms uh, in psychology, for example. But the general doctrine of meliorism is that the world or society may be improved and the suffering can be alleviated through the right 
rightly directed human effort. So all together, things can get better. They won't be best, they won't be worst. It's about improvement. And that's gonna be extremely relevant to what positive psychology is about. We, we can talk about mitigative meliorism as something that's focused on getting less of what we don't want. For example, we don't want headaches, we don't want stress in our lives, we don't want medical illnesses, versus constructive meliorism, uh, focusing on getting more of what we actually do want. For example, physical fitness or, or health or money. Uh, those, are, those are two different ways of looking at the same concept of embitterment. Right, so decreasing the negative versus de increasing the positives. Well, unfortunately, in the mainstream psychology, the mitigative process is the most common one where we're constantly focusing on putting out fires, right? Or helping us, uh, focus, focusing on helping us get less of what we don't want. We want less anxiety, we want less depression, we want less stress. Uh, versus positive psychology is more constructive familiarism where we focusing on helping us get more of what we do want such as concept of growing gardens if we continue to focus on positive things in our lives those seeds will blossom into beautiful gardens and that positivity will continue to flourish and expand so again how do we sort of improve and add more positive aspects to our lives Martin Seligman, who is considered to be the father of, of positive psychology and who is currently at the University of Pennsylvania, said that well-being is more than just absence of disease. A lot of times people think that well-being is being healthy, not having problems. He believes that actually psychology is half-baked, and he's probably right, literally half-baked. We have baked the part about mental illness, we have baked the part about repair and damage, but the other side is completely unbaked. The side of strengths, the side of what we are good at, the side of what makes life worth living. And the concept of life worth living has also been introduced in other um, uh, psychological approaches such as dialectical be behavioral therapy as a very important way of helping people see what would be the life that they want, kind of focusing on the positives rather than constantly looking at the negative aspects of their life. So what is well-being? Well, according to Dr. Seligman, um, the acronym PERMA applies, which it consists of five aspects, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment. So let's go through them so that you understand what they're about and how they may apply to us. Well, well-being involves positive emotions, such as joy, gratitude, serenity, content, hope, uh, gratitude, love. Um, there's ways to measure positive emotions. We're not gonna go, in, go into the ways to measure them, but they're available for you on the slide. And what's most important is that positive emotions can be grown. And uh, two interesting exercises are, and that are, that are frequently actually used and, in, and been um, assimilated into other therapeutic approaches. One is three good things exercise. You basically sit down at the end of the day and you mention what's the first good thing that happened to me and what was the cause of that and you then list two more. As you're doing that, you will notice that you are increasing your positive emotional states. And if you do this on a consistent basis, not only are you gonna be able to refocus your mind on more positive aspects of your life, but also increase the actual experience of positive emotions in that, at that point. Another interesting exercise that, that people can engage in is gratitude letters. Literally sitting down and writing gratitude letters, whether it's to your mom or your dad, your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, whoever, someone you can be thankful for for something that they have done, no matter how small it was. Again, that allows you to step away from the negative emotions of the stressors in our lives and focus on the positive things to improve and increase the positive emotions that will add to our well-being. Is there a question? No, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, being also involves engagement, and that is defined as being absorbed and interested and involved. Um, again, if you you guys can think about all of these uh, uh, aspects of well-being, how it applies to either yourself or your child on the spectrum, and we can talk about it during our Q and A later. But uh, as a definition, it, the concept of engagement is being absorbed or interested or involved in whatever that is happening in your life. More, the more engaged you are, the more you can have control over what's going on. Um, sometimes people talk about extreme engagement. The reason why I have a picture of Jordan and LeBron there 
um, because they, you know, athletes frequently talk about being in the zone, right, or having a flow. And this is their ability to be completely absorbed and engaged in whatever, whatever it is that they're doing in the moment. Frequently, they claim that this is when they perform the best, right? Now, interestingly, the engagement can also be grown uh, using your strengths, especially, for example, according to the study by Park, zest can be very helpful. And it, zest is a, is a very interesting strength, is, is the ability to approach the situation or just life in general uh, with excitement and energy and basically not doing things uh, halfway or half, of half-heartedly. This is very common issue that I see a lot with teenagers and, and yeah, even young adults nowadays where there's no zest about what they're doing and everything is done with sort of this malaise. Um, so in order to improve engagement, for example, acting in a zest uh, kind of uh, behavior would definitely improve the, the engagement in life and therefore improve your well-being. Furthermore, well-being involves the relationships and which are defined by feeling loved, supported, and valued and reciprocating that kind of love and support and value towards others. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I, I always like to add these interesting ways that you can sort of build, build on relationships. We talked about social skills and communication skills a lot in this group. And I guess I'm pretty sure it's going to come up again um, uh, during our Q&A. But for example, an interesting concept that comes from positive psychology as a social skill uh, is called active constructive responding. It's basically a way of responding whenever somebody is sharing an interesting or positive experience uh, or event in their life with you. And the receiver of those good news is actively and constructively responds uh, to it, uh, which allows both people to experience a boost in the well-being who uh, those two people who are involved in the conversation so basically when somebody is sharing something positive with you if you can reflect and positively be involved and supportive of that person's positive experience that in itself will improve your well-being and also improve the bond between two people so this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, social skill can definitely strengthen the relationships that you have in your life. And people would love at that point to be around you more and to share more with you as you're engaging in this kind of uh, social interaction approach, okay? Uh, another aspect of well-being is the meaning of life, right? The purpose, the, the direction. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, some exercises about improving and or helping you understand the meaning of life uh, are you know they're listed here two of them one of them is composing positive visions of the future i frequently ask my clients in the session when i see that there's a little bit of difficulty with motivation or understanding of direction in life is what is it that you would love to see happen in your life what would be the positive outcome of your life we talked earlier uh, from the Seligman's quote, what would be the life worth living? So composing this kind of vision of your own future is essential because it can actually guide you and lead you and also clarify what it is that you want to experience. Without knowing where you want to be, it's very difficult to choose the right uh, direction and be motivated to go there. Another interesting exercise is to uh, write obituaries through the eyes of uh, your grandchildren. What would your grandchildren say about you, about your strengths, about your accomplishments, about who you were as a person? Um, and, and that allows people to think about the positive qualities uh, that they have, their strengths. Okay, So this is another way to help a person get closer and a clearer definition of their, the meaning of life. Again, and, and these concepts, by the way, can be somewhat abstract. And therefore, when you are dealing with individuals on the spectrum, you may have to help them by guiding them through the process of these exercises, by demonstrating how it would be. For example, in the session, I will explain how, what a vision of uh, the future that I have for myself at their age and so forth, so that they understand all of the aspects of, of what it would mean to paint this kind of picture of a positive future for yourself. Another aspect of uh, well-being is accomplishment, which is defined by achievement, mastery, or competence. And it's in positive psychology, it's, a, it's very important that the focus is on understanding that self-discipline 
is greater than intelligence or talent. So ability to, to have a better discipline and, and uh, being able to, for example, be studious, stay on task and so forth is more important than your natural ability to achieve. Uh, you know, throughout UCLA and at Stanford, I saw my peers who were, some of them were just absolutely brilliant and their IQ and talent allowed them to get through school and do well. And then I also saw others who might not have been as um, gifted intellectually, but yet their self-discipline was so great that, that they frequently actually performed even better in classes and achieved as much as those with more sort of natural sort of IQ uh, uh, capacity. And th therefore you see that little uh, image over there where it says 10,000 hours to master your craft. <laughs> eight, eight hours a day, five days a week, 44 weeks a year, so five and a half years to go. So you better get started. It's true, they say that if you want to become good at anything uh, or masterful at anything, you have to spend about 10,000 hours uh, doing or uh, practicing that particular uh, craft. And that's where self-discipline comes in. So it's not as important what talent you have, it's about how much effort you can put in and, and discipline to uh, make sure that you stay on task and practice. Alex? I yes. wanted to interrupt you because it kind of might even fit with that discussion a little bit. Um, Nicholas had a comment question. He says, when I'm earnestly interested in something, I hit, fl I hit flow very easily so much that I lose track of time, forget to eat, drink, etc. Any tips for interrupting self? And said, please define, give an example of constructive response to good news. Um. Okay, so I guess constructive response to good news is when somebody says that, for example, let's make it very simple. I, I just got a new car and it's, a, it's a really great, it's electric and I'm saving so much money on gas. Somebody who engages in talking about this event with that person in a positive way saying something, wow, that's really great. How many miles uh, do you get per charge? That's, that's amazing, you're gonna be saving the environment, it's kind of getting on board of the positivity of that particular situation and engaging in this positive interaction rather than you know, what so, some other people have a tendency to do is that they, because of their own challenges and issues, that they wish that, for example, this was happening with them, they are not showing their positivity in response and, and therefore show lukewarm responses about it saying, oh, cool. Okay, and then they change the topic to something else or they uh, engage in a very sort of a small way that is not allowing the other person to feel like you're happy with them, right? And so your happiness with the person who's sharing those positive emotions will feed into the dynamic between you two and that person in return is gonna bring more positivity. It's, it's, a, it's an upward spiral of positivity between two people. And that strengthens the bond because people who can be happy for you are always viewed and appreciated more than those who do not mirror that experience. Does that make sense about uh, constructive responses, positive constructive responses? Yeah. Um, sorry, and, and the first question was about how do I interrupt, how do you interrupt the flow? Is that, is that what it was? Correct. Well, I, in, in terms of the flow and engagement, I think it's important to, as you're going through these concepts of positive psychology, is to, to focus on which engagement is more important in your life. There's going to be engagement for fun, for example, playing video games. You know, you can do that for hours and enjoy it. You can watch a movie or movies and, or binge on Netflix. All of that can show significant amount of engagement. But it's important that this kind of, this level of engagement is practiced in other areas as well that can further improve your life, okay? And, and that's related to the ultimate goal that we talked about earlier of, 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 of meaning of life, right? So what is it that you see in your future? What is your positive vision of the future? And what uh, behaviors and, and aspects of your life can lead you there? And if you identified what they are, allowing this kind of energy and this kind of zest like you have for example with video games to be transitioned into other areas because you truly believe that this is going to bring the positive changes in your life will 
is the way to not just interrupt the original flow, but rather generalize the flow to other areas. So it's not about inter interrupting the, the, <laughs> the flow of fun activities, it's about finding happiness and understanding the positive uh, outcomes and the rewards of using the same zest and the flow in other areas as well, rather than seeing them just purely tedious. Does that, does that answer the question? I think so. Um, do you want any more questions right now or would you rather go with the flow? Um, let's, let's have another question before we go on. To okay. Um, yeah. I, just one more from Nicholas was, cons well, I've got two more, let's see. Um, one more from Nicholas was, he was concerned, what if he picks the wrong positive response? How did he say this? Uh, Uh, so reinforced by what if you guess wrong about what is good about it not just fun things i do this when programming projects to the tunnel vision thing i mean so i guess when he when he's trying to be positive he doesn't necessarily say the appropriate thing well again as i mentioned that this is a social skill right and with with practice comes comes mastery we talked about that as well so you don't have to be great at doing so. You just have, if you, as long as you have a mindset that this is what you will try to do when you're interacting with other people is to bring this kind of positivity about whatever topics that, that are being discussed, you will get better over time. You know, uh, it's interesting because when I was preparing this, of course, the concept of, of theory of mind and autism came into play and, and I could see the challenge of sort of having this ability to mirror the other person's experience. But I think positive emotions are fairly basic uh, in general as a general concept. And recognizing that somebody's in a good mood does not take a lot of sort of this natural reflexive uh, affect, affective empathy. And instead, one can practice their cognitive empathy, something that I brought up many times in these groups, as a way to understand why is this person happy and therefore what can I say to add to their happiness or make them feel like I understand uh, that they're having this positive experience and I'm really happy for them. Now, again, it's a practice, uh, it's practice of social skills. So the best thing to do this is to start simply at home. You know, when uh, somebody says, when a parent comes home from work and uh, they say something good about what, ha uh, about what happened at work, practicing this kind of positive responding would be a perfect time to do so, right? Uh, you can do this with your friends. They, they, friends like to share positive things with each other. And so when you're interacting with your friends, practice this positive responding. So, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but as long as you understand what your ultimate goal in that social interaction is, slowly but surely you will get better. Doesn't mean that there can't be a chal uh, challenges or, or as, as uh, you know, somebody will say, not, there might not be perfect, uh, responses, but the way that positive psychology uh, views these experiences, it's not about perfection, right? It's, a, it's about improvement, right? We talked about not optimism, not pessimism, but meliorism. We're trying to make things better, including the practice of social interaction, okay? All right. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll go on. And again, all of these questions are going to be very important for the end. And we're going to try to, uh, the problem is I just can't see them on my screen. Otherwise, I wouldn't uh, ask Judy to tell me who's writing what. Okay, so uh, let's talk about positive psychology practices. Um, positive emotion. Uh, well, gen generating positive emotions helps broaden, build our resources, and moves us toward greater well-being. We talked about why, how that can happen. Um, Another important aspect is mindset adapting. So changing your attitudes can really help us change the way that we see the world and the view the world. The growth mindset, we'll talk about that in a minute, is also allowing us to not just experience the world, but grow from our experiences rather than bring us down and close us off. Close us off. Uh, <clears throat> mindfulness, you probably heard about mindfulness training. It's a really, really uh, uh, big and growing field of helping people be more present in the moment, right? It's the opposite of mindlessness. 
uh, it allows us to stay present for whatever is going on with us rather than, than everything that's going on in our lives becoming a white noise where we're not noticing good and only bad things begin to surface. Resilience, uh, practice and resilience is the capacity to withstand and adapt to the challenges of li that life throws at us. The more resilient we are, the easier it is it, the easier it will be for us to deal with life's uh, difficult moments and will allow us to continue on our path to improving our lives. Optimism, we talked about that already, is the tendency to expect the best possible outcomes. Gratitude, I think it's a very important concept, especially for, for the families or with individuals on the spectrum. Uh, practicing gratitude makes us aware of the good things that happen and connect us to a sense of life. Right? Being grateful, as we talked about writing those gratitude letters, can be essential to help us see how much good we actually have in, in, in our lives, how, much po how many positive things are occurring in our lives. As a clinical psychologist, frequently we focus on, on, like I said, all of the sort of negative symptoms of a certain condition, how we ameliorate those symptoms by decreasing the symptoms. But I, what, I always, what I frequently see is that there's so many individuals on the spectrum who don't necessarily pay as much attention to all the good things that, that are going on for them. And so gratitude is an important concept of positive psychology that can be applied in interacting with those on the spectrum and for, for those on the spectrum themselves. And of course, focusing on strengths. When we use our strengths, we enjoy what we are doing. We do better and feel that we are working toward our potential. This is not a new concept in a field of autism. A lot of people say that if individual on the spectrum can, for example, find a career within their special interest, which is technically a strength because there is a significant amount of knowledge, mastery, uh, and capacity for, uh, for that particular uh, topic, that could be a strength, right? So, but there's other ways to grow our strengths beyond the just one focused um, interest. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. So Barbara Fredrickson said that positivity puts the brakes on negativity. In a heartbeat, negativity can spike your blood pressure. Positivity can calm it. Positivity works like a reset button in our lives. And positive emotions that truly are sort of the hallmark of our happiness and well-being. Um, we, when we feel better, we definitely perform better. I mean, there's some, <laughs> again, we talked about Michael Jordan. I think he was, he had a fever of like 103 and he had the best <laughs> game of his life. Uh, but those are rare moments. And I'm sure because of his 10 or 20,000 of mastery hours, it probably happened to him. Uh, it would have happened to him anyways. But we usually do perform better when we feel better. Um, high energy emotions like excitement, zest, and enthusiasm can shift our mood and our physiology really fast. There's uh, definitely some, a lot of studies that show that laughter is the quickest way we can activate the healing effect of positive emotions. The studies also show that even uh, smiling, smile itself triggers uh, specific uh, neurotransmitters in our brain that are released that make us feel good. So just a few minutes of laughter a day can definitely reduce your stress, improve your heart rate, muscle activity, digestion, and immune system. Uh, I always say to uh, my clients is that the more positive that you are, the more people will come to you. They will congregate around you because having po positive people around you improves your own uh, emotional state. So they say positive emotions are contagious. When you're positive, other people are going to be more positive around you. It's very difficult to be, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that SNL sketch. Uh, Oh, Debbie Downer. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember that, but it's kind of a funny sketch where they were having, friends are having fun and she's always saying something that really brings the, the mood down. It's, it's really a, a not cohesive experience for people. And so it's very hard to be the opposite of someone who is very positive on, on a regular basis. Therefore, if you're positive yourself, you're probably gonna uh, see more people who are positive around you. And then as, as a concept of the actual practice, you got to try to maximize the fun moments to feel happier and healthier and try to decrease the duration and intensity of, of your negative, um, of your lows. Okay. And you have to try this in as many aspects of your life as possible. <clears throat> Gandhi said um, that I change myself, I change my world. 
And it's true, our mindset influences how we perceive our reality. I've given a lot, a lot of lectures uh, with OC, ASG and, and other organizations about the concept of cognitive distortions from uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's, it's interesting how the positive psychology is really sort of overlapping with that because technically it is all about our perception of the events that are occurring uh, around us. So positive uh, attitude can influence the way we respond, our impact on others and happiness level. The more we recognize the power to make conscious positive choices, the more <clears throat> difference we can make to our own and other people's well-being. So if you see that something is going on in your life and you interpret it in a negative way, most likely not only you are going to be affected, but the well-being of other people who are related to you will also be uh, upset by that. There's two different mindsets that are important to mention. One is a fixed mindset, which is basically the belief that the basic qualities like intelligence and talent are static traits. And people usually accept them for what they are and they don't try to work on them and don't spend time developing them. Versus a different mindset, which is called the growth mindset, where people see themselves as a constant work in progress, where they believe again that through, uh, through mastery, they can nurture their abilities and their talents, and they actually can reach pretty high level of success. <clears throat> um, and you know, an interesting study by Dr. Uh, Sonia Lubomirsky from University of California, Riverside, which is here, not, not far away, uh, she showed a very interesting outcome that showed that 50% of the difference between people's happiness levels can be explained by genetically determined set points. So, for example, you know, your intelligence, your uh, emotion regulation, physical emotional regulation, certain uh, development of parts of the brain, and so forth. So there's the physiology and genes that are responsible for the 50% difference in terms of people's happiness levels. 10% is linked to your circumstances, whether you're rich or poor, married or divorced, healthy or unhealthy. Environmental factors account for a portion of your happiness. And it's very interesting that it's only 10% that, that, is, that, that actually has an effect on whether or not the person feels happy. This is uh, why a lot of times people say that money doesn't make you happy. Well, you know, money can alleviate some stressors, but it's not gonna make you happy. You can have a lot of money, but not necessarily experience happiness. And I've had clients like that who were very wealthy people and unfortunately they were in severe depressive states. And uh, you know, on the surface it's very difficult to understand, but it is because money or these external factors or circumstances are not really what makes somebody happy. It is the way that you see your world, the way that you see yourself. So what she found is that 40% is influenced by intentional activities. This means that, that we can increase or decrease almost half of our happiness level through our choices and mindset. So we have significant amount of, of, of control in terms of whether or not we are feeling happy. Okay. Oh, you know, I wish I could see the crowd, but <laughs> so I can answer questions or yeah, it's so hard to do it on Zoom. But anyways, let's get... Oh, there, there's no real questions yet, uh, Alex. And um, there's a big topic to discuss, but I am I think we're going to save that to the end in terms of a discussion of CBT. But okay. I think that would be best um, as you move through the presentation because I know you will have a lot to say about that. Okay. So mindfulness, as I mentioned, mindfulness uh, training is, is widespread at this point. And Dalai Lama said that mental activities like meditation can actually change the brain. Well, he was, he was right, even though he probably didn't, didn't do a lot of physiological studies. But mindfulness involves resting our awareness in one place for an extended period of time without being distracted. This is very challenging for a lot of people. It is very challenging even for those on the spectrum, especially the, those who may experience restlessness right uh, or, or if they if their mind is making these leaps and jumps uh, and or or is racing however with practice again one can reach a, a higher level of ability to be mindful in the moment and slow your mind down <clears throat> you know Ellen, Ellen Langer defines mindfulness as the process of actively noticing new things uh, it's the opposite of mindlessness, where we don't notice anything. Sometimes people go through the day and they don't know what happened. 
uh, I guess the best analogy would be, I don't know if you guys ever had this experience, when you're driving home from work, you get home and you don't even know how you got home because you were thinking about something else. It's not like you were not aware that you were driving, but your mind was just absorbed by other things and dismissing what was going on uh, around you in that moment. Um, and because driving is an overlearned behavior, we're able to do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> When we approach the world with a mindful awareness, we can more accurately assess and respond to the situations and people. Um, it's the, the, again, the idea is to be able to separate yourself from the past beliefs and anxieties so you can accept yourselves and others. So if we focus on here and now and not on what was or what could be in the future, especially the anxieties and negative interpretations, we are gonna be able to more accept ourselves better and therefore, except other people as well. The three important quali uh, qualities of uh, mindfulness states are relaxation, which is settling the body in a neutral, natural state, uh, stillness, avoiding the movement to quiet the mind. Again, the physical movement is associated with activation of the mind. So in this situation, we actually want to avoid the, the physical movement. And vigilance, careful focused attention on the mind itself moment by moment, thinking about what is it that I'm thinking about right now? Not just allowing the mind to run sort of on, on tangents and, 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 and you following them, but rather think about what you're thinking about. It's kind of, it's called the metacognitive process, right? <clears throat> and what's interesting that this board is, uh, through, in a Harvard study showed that there's actual long-term effects on the amygdala by practicing uh, mindfulness uh, meditation. And amygdala is, is what's responsible for fight or flight, which is basically our stress mechanism, right? Well, he showed that even two weeks after mindfulness practices, if they're practiced on a regular basis, and then one takes a pause, up to two weeks, amygdala activation is decreased. Therefore, we are not experiencing the same levels of stress um, um, as we would if we didn't practice mindfulness, which is a significant important for our population because we anxiety is probably the number one comorbid condition in <clears throat> in autism and amygdala and fight or flight response is responsible uh, for uh, experiences with anxiety okay resilience also a very important topic resilience is a capacity to withstand and adapt the challenges life throws at us Resilient people fulfill their potential despite the adversity and then to see challenges as opportunities for growth and renewal. What, what I see a lot of times happening for, for my clients is that once they are, once they are facing some of the challenges and adversities uh, in, the world, in their world, what I see instead of taking on those challenges and trying to grow from them, try to improve and, and become better at it, there is a tendency to withdraw, right? Escape and avoid. And this is why we see sometimes a lot of uh, self-isolation because self-isolation is safe uh, from stressors. But the resilience can only be developed if you actually take on those challenges and adversities as you're improving your own masteries with whatever it is that's happening. And there's a number of different ways that people use resilience. They overcome the difficult circumstances or negative consequences of life to steer through daily stressors, to bounce back from setbacks, to reach out to pursue new goals and the strongest sense of self. Um, and they, of course, interestingly enough, that we, we do know for, from brain studies that emotions, brain and body are all interlinked. And when you engage in certain activities, it will have an effect, physical activities, it will have an effect on your emotional states. For example, exercising or uh, rela relaxation, deep breathing techniques will help you get oxygen to your body in the brain and therefore it will change your emotional state frequently lowering the anxiety slowing down the fight or flight uh, response giving you more energy and ability to get engaged in life so for example uh, when you're not when something negative is happening with you you can show resilience by for example going for a walk to change that negative experience into a more positive emotional state tidy up your desk uh, just as a practice of doing something positive in the moment of, of negative, exp uh, negative experiences or time in your life. Giving somebody a hug in, when you're feeling down and sad, upset, instead of showing that emotion and practicing that emotion by brooding, for example, or isolating, 
going in the opposite direction of something positive, giving somebody a hug can change the emotional state significantly. <clears throat> and also you will get reciprocate, social reciprocation in that moment as well that will reinforce that action. Smiling at somebody, very likely that other people will smile at you as well, right? So, and that kind of social reinforcement can change that negative experience and therefore you will show resilience in face of whatever that's happening to you at that moment. Optimism, <clears throat> again from Martin Seligman, is a tendency to expect the best possible outcome or dwell on the most hopeful aspects of a situation. If we're optimistic, we tend to see more solutions. We tend to be more successful as we believe they will work. We stay motivated. That keeps us going, right? But we're not talking about uh, what people say blind optimism. Positive psychology is a lot more realistic and a lot more uh, entrenched in, in uh, what's in reality and here and now. And so if there's rocks on the road, we will see those rocks but we will see that there's a path through them rather than get focus on the fact that there's rocks that are blocking some of the ease of our path, right? Um, <clears throat> for example, when a problem occurs, an optimistic thinker believes they're not completely at fault. They're not dismissing their involvement because that would be, again, what is uh, that blind optimism, right? Oh, it's not, nothing is my fault. I'm going to externalize the problem and blame everything and every, everyone around me, but rather, it is not completely my fault because there's certain circumstances that might have played a part in this particular situation. And in addition to that, the situation itself is fleeing and changeable and you can have an effect on the outcome, right? And what has been shown to be helpful for people to remember to be optimistic or to develop a habit of being optimistic is for example, wearing a bracelet that would be a representation of positivity and optimistic outlook for yourself. Having a sticky note in the bathroom every morning or at work or in your car. Um, <laughs> most people are walking around with their phones. I had, a, I had a young adult who put that as a background on his phone. So whenever he would look at his phone, the first thing he would see is for example, this, this little, uh, image down there that he shared with me you know, and, and I understand that the, you know, there's some biblical relevance but and relevance to NA and AA practices but this too shall pass this idea that this shall that this too shall pass that even if this is something problematic that this is not going to be the constant right so challenging your negative thoughts and substitute alternative causes uh, that are changeable specific and impersonal can really help to bring that optimistic view of the world, more realistic optimistic view of the world, and thus change the way that you feel. And that goes back again to the cognitive behavioral therapy of, of changing your uh, negative interpretations. This is, a, again, a big one. I, I really think that gratitude goes a long way. Uh, Marcel Proust said that, let us be grateful to the people who make us happy. They're the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. And it's true, you know, uh, I, I see that there's not enough of that happening in the families, for example, of those on the spectrum. I don't see a lot of times parents who come to me and say, oh, my, my, my son or daughter are constantly coming to me and showing appreciation for what I do for them. If anything, there's this negative dynamic of the lack of gratitude. Um, and gratitude is the quality of being thankful. The readiness to show appreciation and return the kindness back it makes us aware of the good things that happen to us. Um, people say that if you practice a lot of uh, researchers actually say that when you practice gratitude, it associated with psychological growth and ability and the coping style that is more positive in nature. Because as you looking for gratitude, <clears throat> how to show gratitude, you're ultimately restructuring the way that you think about the negative aspects of your, of your life in more positive ways. Um, okay, we mentioned that already. Um, gratitude is, the, is one of the most powerful antidotes to negative emotions uh, and depression. Studies show that when people write regularly about the things that they're grateful for, their mood, coping behavior, and even physical health improves. So as one of the, uh, similar to focusing on the po three positive things that happen in, in your uh, daily life, there's a suggestion that helps with improving uh, your, your practice of gratitude showing is through keeping a journal or a checklist. 
uh, of weekly things that you are thankful for and you can, and you can show gratitude for to other people who you have shown gratitude for to other people. But most important is that you don't do this because you have to. You know, it has to be something that you really are, uh, uh, want to do yourself, right? You train to notice your brain. Uh, you, you train your brain to notice positive experiences that happen to increasing your own natural positivity. So you have to know that this is done for yourself and not for someone else. And as you practice this, as it becomes more of a routine, you begin to see the positivity uh, overtaking your negative uh, views of life. Focus, focusing on strengths. Uh, <clears throat> Alex Lindley says the strengths energize people, enabling them to be at their best. When we use our strengths, we enjoy what we are doing. We do it better and we feel we are working toward our potential. Um, and he uh, defines it as pre-existing capacity for a particular way of behaving, thinking or feeling that is authentic and energizing to the user and enables optimal functioning, development and performance. You know, in the field of autism, that is extremely important. There's a lot of times that, that for example, when I see um, uh, reports, psychological reports being written, there's a lot of focus on, on the issues and, and, and the symptoms, rather than focus on the strengths. And well-balanced reports will help people understand what their strengths are and, and will give suggestions in terms of how to uh, enable yourself to use those strengths. Um, and in general, when people are using their strength, they, they feel happier. They know that they're doing something that they're good at, and that helps them uh, uh, in their self-development. But a good exercise for those don't, who don't know what their strengths are would be to for, go for, through this uh, checklist. <clears throat> for example, in uh, this area of energy, what activities give you energetic buzz? Answering that question may, may uh, give you a clue that this is one of the strengths, whatever the answer would be. Authenticity, when, when do you feel more like the real you, right? Uh, where you don't have to pretend to be someone else. That would also be your strengths. Ease, uh, what activities come naturally to you? Would you excel at sometimes without even trying? A lot of times we dismiss that because it's such an easy thing for us to do, but it is very important because it is, it is our strength. Attention, where do you focus? What activities may play to your strengths, right? Rapid learning, what have you picked up um, quickly, almost effortlessly? For example, I have uh, clients who are, you know, who have this library of knowledge about certain, say about movies, about film industry, for example. And the question is, well, is it, is it truly their strength in that particular area? And if so, then it is a strength that they have to build upon. Motivation, what activities do you simply, uh, uh, do, that you do simply for the love of doing them, right? Something that you don't have to be coerced in doing, uh, forced to do or bribed to do. What is it that you just do because you love doing them? Your voice, a shift in passion, energy and engagement probably means you're talking about a strength. So when you talk, when, when I see my, my clients talk about something they're really into, their mood changes, their presentation changes, their voice changes. That means that this, that passion is their strength, whatever that may be. Words and phrases. When you say, I love to, or it's just great when, you're probably talking about something that you're really good at and some kind of strength that you can also add to your list. And most importantly, the last one, <laughs> I think it's great, uh, to-do lists. Things that never make it to your to-do list are often those, <laughs> uh, those you never need to be asked twice to do, which means those are your strengths as well something that you do without a necessity to be reminded of, okay? So this kind of little exploration can help an individual identify some of their strengths. And again, this is a really quick way of doing this, but I think it's important to engage in a conversation about this with um, your, your, your children or your partners or your friends so that they can even help you give, uh, and give you some feedback and their observations in terms of what, uh, what, what would be the best answers for some of these questions. Okay, now before we switch to the positive psychology application with ASD, as, as I was trying to already talk about this in previous slides, I wanted to see if there's any questions about uh, what, what I was talking about earlier. So if you have any questions, you can use the chat. I haven't seen anything, Alex. All right, well, then we can proceed. Yes. Okay, um, so I think the five most relevant characteristics of positive psychology for ASD would be 
optimism, humor, self-efficacy, uh, kindness, and resilience. Um, we talked about optimism already, but promoting optimism in people with autistic spectrum disorder could increase successful problem-solving skills, decrease a sense of helplessness, and promote a sense of autonomy that could be beneficial. Again, having this, the optimistic view of what will happen can also decrease the anxiety, right? Because if you always feel like uh, you will have a trouble with, and then you fill in the blank, the, the optim staying optimistic is very difficult. However, realistic optimism saying, I may have some challenges with this, but I've learned, for example, a, a new way of interacting, a new way of doing something, and I will try to achieve mastery with that slowly but surely, is the more optimistic way of facing that situation. So using optimism in, uh, in, in, in working with individuals on the spectrum or in, as, as a parent or a partner of somebody on the spectrum is extremely important to help them see the other side of that coin. Um, humor. Humor facilitates social connections and interactions that can be both enjoyable and stressful. People will turn to humor to relieve both anticipated and actual stress. Individuals with autism are frequently challenged by anxiety and stress responses when confronted with social demands. So being able to fuse humor into uh, the social practice can alleviate some of that, that social stress in, in, in those situations and therefore make social situations less anxiety provoking and more uh, of something that the individual enjoys. Now, I know that there have been attempts at teaching humor, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about looking at things from the more humorous, positive, and the more humorous, positive light, rather than focusing on the negativity of the experience. And um, I, you know, a lot of times in my sessions with my clients, I, I infuse our discussions with humor because otherwise it becomes fairly sort of <laughs> challenging and, 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 and stressful experience to constantly talk about things that need to improve, focusing again on, on the specific uh, amelioration of negative symptoms. It is about seeing the, 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 the humor in certain situations in life. It's about finding this, this ability to use humor as you're interacting with others that will tame the negative experiences uh, that we sometimes are faced with in our life. So humor is essential. And again, I think it's a, it's actually incorrect that individuals on the spectrum are not using humor, uh, don't, don't have the sense of humor. They actually do have a sense of humor. It's the use of humor that sometimes as a social skill can be a little bit more problematic, but that is, again, that is a matter of mastery rather than inability, right? Um, Self-efficacy um, is the belief that people have, uh, have about their ability and readiness to perform a task. Um, it, it's really difficult to stay positive if you don't feel like you can be self-efficacious and, you cannot, and that you cannot believe in yourself, right? Um, Self-efficacy is required in order to cope effectively with life demands and improve quality, right? If you believe you can do something, then you can be, go out there and no matter what challenge comes your way, you believe that you can adapt to it. Uh, and it's de uh, developed by cumulative positive experiences and learning. And if somebody is staying away from, for example, and isolating from life and not engaging, remember we talked about engagement, not engaging with zest in life's challenges, one is not developing self-efficacy. So we would definitely know that, that individuals on the spectrum struggle with learning new skills and they're exposed to the frequent failures sometimes, but teaching skills and nurturing controllable positive behaviors and habits that lead to productivity and increasing the learner's awareness of other cap capabilities can benefit their self-efficacy. For example, in our peers program, we, when we teach the social skills, we don't just uh, throw people out there and, and say, okay, now you go practice. No, we actually try to make sure that they are practicing in the most positive environment that will produce positive responses from uh, people that they will be socializing with or interacting with because we want to solidify the concept of their social self-efficacy. Right, we are we are trying to make sure that we're controlling as many variables as we can in the beginning, as they're just developing these skill, these social skills, communication skills, and uh, solidifying their self social self efficacy. Um, okay, 
another thing is a very important concept is kindness. You know, this is frequently uh, talked uh, about as you know, helpfulness towards someone in need. People describe it <clears throat> as making thoughtful choices and doing benevolent things for others. However, most of the research in autism field is about other people being kind to those on the spectrum. Where, where, what, what I, what, again, maybe with my population more than let's say with lower functioning population, when we talk about high functioning individuals on the spectrum, we're talking about them engaging in kind acts towards others. They will more likely be accepted as contributors in the community or in their family and, that, and to step out of their more familiar dependent roles as consumers of services. Again, we want to make sure that the focus is coming from the individual out into the world. The, the whole concept of autism is a lot of times it's internalized, it's focused on self, not because of selfishness of a person, but rather because of the nature of the condition. So externalizing kindness will be a forced way of sort of projecting that positivity from the individual on the spectrum. And therefore, as we talked about before, positivity breeds positivity in others and bringing the right people into their world for even further better social uh, experiences. Um, it's definitely possible to teach uh, kind deeds and other pro-social behaviors related to kindness. <clears throat> for example, in drama, through role-playing, in real life, through pet and animal therapy, volunteering in community, and many other different ways as well. Okay. Um, so we talked about resilience earlier. We talked about what that means, but people with autism spectrum disorders have unique challenges that make them vulnerable in the face of adversity. Their ability to cope and adjust is dependent upon their cognitive capabilities, communication skills, flexibility, and social problem solving capacities, right? So um, having deficits in such areas can, can definitely affect someone's experience with resilience. But uh, if there's, there's certain things that one can focus on, for example, resilience can be taught to individuals with autism at all levels of functioning by nurturing self-regulation, right? learning how to manage your emotional states, knowing what makes you feel good, knowing what makes you feel positive, um, and increasing opportunities to experience success. We just, we just talked about this in terms of our peers program, where we try to put our teens and young adults in a situation where they're more likely to succeed rather than to face significant adversity. <clears throat> autonomy and independence. I, I don't know how somebody can feel like they're resilient in life where they're dependent on someone else. Resilience means that you are actually able to deal with whatever life throws you away. But if you know that you have to be dependent on someone else for the basic sort of uh, needs in, in your life, it's very difficult to feel that resili resilience and therefore autonomy and independence are extremely important in practice. For example, I always say, if I see somebody who is of age and they're not driving, I, there better be a real neurological reason why they're not driving. There should be no other reason for that, including the anxiety about driving or the anxiety of the parents about their child driving, so forth. Uh, increasing problem solving skills and general knowledge. Uh, problem solving skills are uh, related to executive functioning and Judy said that there's gonna be a few um, a few talks on that and so I, I think it would be important for those who feel like uh, uh, this is an important area for you, for you to learn about to join those meetings um, but the concept of general knowledge is also very very important I see a lot of times the individuals who come to my to my therapy uh, in, in our studies as well had limited knowledge of the world around them because of limited social interactions with their peers. So they weren't learning randomly through random conversations with their peers. They were left to themselves or to their uh, to interactions with their parents or to, ser to their searches online. But you know, it's interesting with Google, Google has probably answers to everything, but you have to search for something in order to get an answer. It's not just gonna throw things at you so you would learn uh, about that. And so this just general knowledge about the world can stand in the way of your resilience because you might not see all the different positive ways that things can work out if you're missing the actual components that make up that situation or, or can make up that situation. Um, so, <clears throat> and the way that resilience can be measured for those who are trying to uh, measure this in some kind of behavioral plans or so forth, 
Um, it can be measured in people with autism is, is their ability to express and execute positive preferences and choices. For example, willingness to learn and experience novelties. <laughs> Simple things like, for example, going out and trying the foods that they haven't tried before because they're basing on the concept that once they tried something new and let's say they had a really bad uh, uh, sensory reaction to it. So trying something new is no longer an option for them, but actually looking at this in a positive light, seeing that, hey, this was just this particular item that tasted this way, and I'm going to give it a try because what if this is, this tastes actually amazing? Having this positive attitude is actually a, a way of showing that somebody's becoming more resilient to the life around them and having more positive uh, uh, outlook. <clears throat> Also maintaining a strong support system and by demonstrating self-regulation and self-control under times of stress. So seeing how many times one becomes dysregulated and negative rather than focusing on improvement and positive outcomes for the future of whatever the negative situation that occurred. And again, it's a mindset and it's, and it, 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 it's not that easy to achieve. It is something to be practiced, of course. Um, I can, I, I can tell you that in sessions, it takes a while for people to begin to look at things in a positive way. <clears throat> That's why homework assignments can be very helpful because they can be done on a regular basis, not just once a week, for example, in, in therapy. Um, I also think that just generally positive psychology should be inserted in, in, in schools, middle school, high school, into IEPs, into IPPs in the regional center. Uh, behavioral plans or and, and therapy and even you know just day-to-day -day interactions with with parents sometimes it's hard for the parents to stay positive and resilient so a lot of these concepts and ideas hopefully will be helpful not just for your an individual on the spectrum but for the parents and siblings and partners around them okay All right, guys, so I went through all of this information just so that we can actually have a discussion and try to answer your more specific questions. I think this is a more interesting part of the presentation where we actually get to talk about these things rather than me just, you know, going off my slides and uh, downloading all this information. By the way, as I said earlier, uh, Judy will provide you guys with a PDF of these slides, so you'll have all of this information to refer back to, okay?